you've got a handout, oh, and you don't have a handout because I got blank paper. I don't know where my mind was. Put it through the copier, and the copier went shoot, 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 shoot. And I just picked them up and brought them. So I don't know what happened. I didn't look. Oh, uh, some time back, we've been working through the Sermon on the Mount and working through the Lord's Prayer, and there was one area where I felt like I did not do justice at all. So I want to go back and revisit that one line in the Lord's Prayer tonight. Uh, <clears throat> and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That line in the Lord's Prayer. So I want to review with you just very quickly what I did do uh, about that when we did that before. I talked about the difference between temptation and testing, uh, temptation versus testing. And first and foremost, we made that distinction uh, that, that temptation, biblically, there are two words in the Bible uh, that deal with this, and, and I'm not going to be scholarly at all tonight because I'm not a scholar. But uh, I used that example when we went through this before about the tempting of Jesus in the wilderness. You know, that's in, in every literature you come across, in the Bible itself, and everyone they, they put in there, you know, a, a subheading for the, the verses that follow the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And we human beings, we Americans, tend to think of when we hear that word temptation, we always seem to, to, to visualize that word, interpret that word as something really bad, that we are being tempted to sin and do something wrong, something against God's will and against his word. That's how we normally look at temptation, right? Am I correct? Okay. But I, I pointed out to you that in the Bible, the Old Testament and the New, oh, this word for temptation really is more akin to testing. I have said repeatedly, I'm saying again tonight, it is important for us to understand that God does not, never has, never will tempt his children to commit sin. God does not do that. God is holy. He doesn't want sin. And, and he doesn't tempt us to do that. But God very much allows us to be tested. And so I want you to remember that distinction that we made on that brief study when we went through that part of the Lord's Prayer previously uh, and, and note the difference between temptation and testing. And so it's testing. So <clears throat> uh, I use the illustration because Gabe was here, and I know he's a bass fisherman, so the rest of y'all do some fishing, and I use that that illustration about, you know, you buy, when I go bass fishing, I fish with 15-pound fish with test line. You hear what I just said? The line that I use has been tested that it will not break until it reaches 15 pounds of torque tension on it. So that's the word that we're talking about, testing, to prove the metal of something. So just understand this difference between temptation and testing. In the Old Testament, Abraham, the Bible says God took, sent Abraham up there to tempt him. And that word temptation is used, but it's not temptation. It's really to test him. And so please get that distinction in your mind. So I won't beat that to death anymore. You, got, you did get a page that's printed on both sides, right? So you got that page, right? Okay, so, so we've, we've reviewed and we've emphasized this distinction between temptation and testing. Now, note one thing in that very first paragraph on the page you got, page one, I highlighted in yellow and, and put it in italics, in temptation slash testing. So everywhere, I, I don't think I missed any, everywhere on both sides of the page where I'm using the word, the phrase, I use both words, temptation slash testing, so that every time you see that phrase in the talk we're doing tonight, your mind, I'm hoping your mind will automatically go back to what we've just reviewed and compare and contrast this business of temptation and testing. It's very difficult sometimes to separate those two because we're going to see in just a moment Satan does come and Satan does tempt us to commit sin. 
And so in that sense of temptation, we understand what he's talking about. All right, so <clears throat> it's important to understand. I've said this. God never attempts to seduce us into sin. But I want to, verify, I want to just keep hammering. It's equally important to note that God does submit us, his children, to a test of obedience and loyalty to his word and his commands. I'm illustrating that by the very first pages in the Bible, in the Garden of Edom, Adam and Eve, God allowed Satan to come in and tempt slash test. You with me on that word now, that combination of those words? God allowed Satan to come in, and Satan absolutely did tempt them to sin and was successful. So they failed the test part. And we all know the result of that. And I have very often said to you, don't be too hard on Adam and Eve. Get up tomorrow morning and tell yourself you are Adam or you are Eve. And see how many minutes it takes for you <laughs> to do something wrong in thought, in mind, in commission or omission. See how long it takes you to become Adam or Eve. I mean, it is, it is what it is. But understand that difference that, this, that I'm talking about, this testing and temptation. It, it's important to understand this great truth, the temptation slash testing is never, ever designed to make us fail in our relationship to God. It's designed to make us stronger, wiser, better men and women. It is never designed to make us sinners. It's always designed to make us good. <clears throat> and if we do fail in the testing, we are not meant to fail. God did not create us to fail. This is, this is a very difficult concept for me. So I'm having great difficulty um, saying what I want to say here, but what I'm trying to say is God did not create us to fail. In John's prologue to his gospel, John chapter 1, John very plainly tells us that, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he goes on to say not, nothing was ever created and made that wasn't made by him, and, and John goes on to say to everyone, anyone, I mean, I love that part in that prologue where John says, the light of the world, talking about Jesus. And, and the phrase, and I preached your sermon on this. I know you don't remember it, so I'm reminding you right now. But I preached your sermon where that light, in John's Gospel chapter 1, the phrasing of that is such that it can never, ever be extinguished. It can't be put out. That's Jesus Christ. His light can never, ever be dimmed or put out. And, and, he, and John goes on to tell us this is Jesus, this is the Word, this is the Messiah, this is the gospel, the good news that God has sent Jesus. And then John says this. John says to everyone who accepts and believes this, I'm paraphrasing, but you can go read it, it's there. John says to everyone who accepts and believes this, he, God, gave them the power to become the sons of God. Wow. So we were not created to fail. We were created to become the sons of God, the sons of Almighty God. I, I can't wrap my head around it. I, I, I want to crawl under a rock when I know who I am, and I know what God created me to be. And that haunts me. It haunts me. It haunts me. I'm chasing rabbits now. I'm sorry. But that, that haunts me to realize that I did not reach the potential that God created me to reach. And, and I think personally for me, that's the greatest sin in the world, not to reach the potential that God gave us. Think about that. I don't, well, we will, not this side, but we will. We will reach it, yes, sir. We will. And I'm waiting anxiously. I'm, you're going to hear me shouting. All the universe is going to hear Brother Digger shouting. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah, I made it. <laughs> yes. 
and I'm anxious to know what God will allow me to do. I don't think we'll go to heaven and sit on the front porch and drink mint juleps the rest of the world, the rest of eternity. I think God's got work for us to do. And I think the work he's going to let us do a lot depends on how we do down here. And so this business of testing and temptation is very important. So, chase that rabbit, didn't I? So I did say to you in that one, two, three, third paragraph, whenever we do fail in the temptation slash testing, we really are meant to emerge stronger. Every time we fail, we should learn a lesson and we should be stronger. Do you remember the sermon I preached to you about strong in the broken places? How God wells us up and we're stronger than we ever were before. That's what I'm talking about right here. That's what I'm talking about. And when we do fail, please go back and reread 1 John 1 9. Who would be bold enough to quote it for me right now? 1 John 1 9. Anybody else? Let's say it together. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's my favorite verse in the Bible, I think. So, we are put to the test to see if we are fit for the particular service that God is calling us to do. Now, here I put that comparison in there, how uh, engineers will design a building. They, they design a steel beam so that it will hold the weight of the building it's supposed to hold. Beams, plural, put together. Every one of y'all have watched as those iron workers put up those skeletons, right? Put up the steel beams and as they're forming up a building. And those beams, though, the, the, the width, the, the design of them, the thickness of them, the composite steel that it's made of, it's all tested to withhold certain pressures. And it's designed not to fail. And so this is what I'm talking about when we are put to the test. Oh, every one of y'all, most of y'all, not every one of y'all, most of y'all live in a house that's built on a slab, a concrete slab. Do you know if your slab was 2,500-pound concrete or 3,000-pound concrete? or What was the testing of your slab? Do you know? No. But I'll tell you what. <clears throat> the, that slab was the, the architect who drew the plan specified a certain kind of concrete to go under your house because he drew the drawings for the house. He knows the weight and distribution of the weight, the wind loads, and all that good stuff. And he knows what that concrete's supposed to support, so he tells the, uh, in his plans, he gives you the, the mixture of concrete he wants. And whether or not you can use uh, plain old steel in it, you know, the roll out the, what do you call it, uh, mesh, wire mesh in it, or if you can put the fibers in it. And, and, and Tom Davis sitting back there will tell you that when you pour a slab, you have to have these little containers that that the person goes, when they're pouring that slab, he goes up the concrete truck when that concrete's coming down the chute and he gets this thing full of concrete and seals it up and he catches that all through that pour on that slab so that every different place in that slab, he's got a little thing full of concrete and that concrete goes to a lab, a laboratory and testing. We use Southern, Southern Earth Sciences here in Mobile at BOA whenever we test these things, whenever we pour, do something like that. And, and that concrete, has to sit a certain number of times and hours, and then that lab person in there takes it out of the shell and breaks it. And he records the strength that it breaks at. And he grinds up some of it and then puts it through these chemicals and all that stuff so he can tell what's in it. So at the end, he sends a report back to the Mobile County of the city of Mobile saying, yes, I tested this concrete, and it met all the specifications of the architect testing testing we have said that God would never attempt to seduce us into sin 
We emphasize again that Satan, the devil, absolutely, constantly, 24-7, does attempt to seduce us into sin. So we need to understand something about those names, Satan and the devil. I was very brief here on your page. In the Hebrew language, the word Satan means an adversary or an opponent. That is, someone who opposes you and who attacks you. The word devil comes from the New Testament, from the New Testament Greek, diabolos, which means slanderer. The devil is one who slanders you before God. So Satan is the adversary, and he becomes the devil, the slanderer, par excellence. Satan, the devil, is the adversary of man, he is the power who constantly attempts to negate the purposes of God and ruin all of us who are children of God. Satan and the devil stand for everything that is against the man and against God. And it is from that destructive power that Jesus in his prayer teaches us to pray to be delivered from. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one from the accuser, from the opponent, from the slanderer. Deliver us from him. So now I turn our thoughts to Satan as to how he attacks us with the temptation and the testing. <clears throat> that old adage, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Very appropriate here. We are forewarned when an, uh, a hurricane is bearing down on us from the Gulf of Mexico, and if we are forewarned, we ought to be forearmed and put all the plywood up on our doors and windows and take precautions to protect our life and liberty from the onslaught of the hurricane. It is, since Satan, the devil, is attempting and does attempt to attack us 24-7, he's always looking for, searching for our weakest point. When I went over this before, I made that analogy that every single one of you in here would understand, that analogy of busting firewood. So we fell a tree and we cut the blocks of wood off the tree and every what length our fireplace is. And uh, we turn that tree trunk over and we brush it off with our glove and we look for those little cracks in that block of wood. And then we take our steel wedge and put it in that crack and take our maul or the back of our axe and we tap it in there and get it started. And then we draw back and whack it with the sledgehammer. And if it's red oak, it goes whoop. <laughs> and if it's gum, you won't bust it. <laughs> you won't leave a log splitter to bust gum. But you all know that. But my point is there's a crack. And that's the weak point. That's where that wood's going to split. And that's where we put our wedge. And so Satan has got a zillion, billion different kind of wedges. And he looks for our weakest point to put his wedges in to separate us from God and from one another. <clears throat> what are your weak spots? What is your weakest spot? All human beings have many, many weak spots. The desire for the lust for, and I listed a few of the common, fame, power, sex, money, fortune. These are just a few. There are hundreds. But I put in yellow the two questions because I want you to really examine that in your heart. Every person, I think, knows their weak spot. I sure know mine. My wife knows mine <laughs> better than I do probably. What are your weak spots? And what is your weakest spot? I think you should name them and know them. And that's where you should be on guard at all the time because that's where the Satan, the devil, is trying to put his wedge to bust you, to split you, to separate you from God who created you and loves you as well as separate you from the fellowship of believers. <clears throat> Each one of us should identify and name our weak spots and our weakest spot, and constantly be on guard for the attacks that surely come that way. Now, we should also note that temptation 
testing does not always come at our weakest spot. Sometimes temptation testing comes at our strongest point. Have you ever said or have you ever heard anyone say, <laughs> you ain't got to worry about that one. That's one I would never do in a million, chameleon years. Not me, no sir, Bubba, not me. <laughs> you ever said that? Heard other people say it? Do you remember Simon Peter when he talked to Jesus? Oh, no, Lord, though everybody else is hurt you, not me. I'm willing to die for you, Lord. His strongest point, he thought. That's right where Satan got him. Mike's comment is that those in the those of us in the ministry are overconfident, and therefore we are not on our guard as strongly, perhaps, and we're overconfident that it's just not going to happen to us. Well, here's my answer to Mike. Mike, you might be overconfident, but Bubba, I'm not. I'm scared to death all the time. <laughs> many, many, pre you are correct, though, in your assertion. You, you really are correct because so many preachers are so godly and so spiritual and so uh, until they, um, I'm sorry, I'm being very ugly here. I know Christians that way. Those people that are so spiritual like that, they, they scare me. I, I'm afraid to be too close to them. I mean, I, I want people to be spiritual and all that, but I think those who are really genuinely spiritual, they don't hang it out there every five minutes. <clears throat> Something between them and God. So, Arrogance. Yes, ma'am. Boy, I should have put that on my paper. Jan, thank you. Arrogance. Arrogance. I don't think God's got much room for arrogance, do you? Man, and I know some arrogant folks. Whew. All right, so let's turn our attention now to naming some defenses we all have against temptation testing. Now, I, I took the four things here straight out of Barclay. And I put my words to him, but I took his four points right here. But I've footnoted that on every time I've done a Bible study. And I've got the asterisks up there. So you know that this is where I'm getting most of my information, that I'm using most of my information from Barclay and from the Interpreter's Bible. <clears throat> so Barclay gives four defenses that we all have against this temptation and testing from Satan and the devil. I'm, I'm calling Satan two different names, but it's one being. I, I need you to understand that, but this one being has two different purposes. <clears throat> he is the opposer. He opposes us, and he is the slanderer. <clears throat> He's our enemy. <clears throat> He's our number one enemy. <clears throat> Here are some defenses against his temptation slash testing. Number one, self-respect. I think when a person loses their self-respect, I don't know what else they got to lose. I mean, if you lose your self-respect, it's very difficult to look in the mirror every morning. If you lose your self-respect, what do you have? My granddaddy, Morgan Merchant, when I was a boy, my granddaddy had some kind of eye disease, and he, was, he, he couldn't see. He was legally blind. Later in life, they found some ways to help him, and he could see shadows and stuff, but but he was legally blind. So my granddaddy learned to live in that world in which you could not see. And back way back then when I was a boy, City of Mobile had something called the Mobile Association for the Blind. Downtown Mobile, they had a building where they made straw brooms. You know, the old, what, not straw, but what do you call them? But, but the old brooms like Ann grew up with and some of y'all <laughs> grew up with. <laughs> and, Right now, you can't hardly buy them anywhere, you know. But not, No, not whisk broom, but the material they're made out of, I'm calling it straw, but it's a proper word for it that I can't come up with right now. Anyway, my granddaddy went down to the Association for the Blind. They taught him how to navigate and how to work and how to do stuff, and they taught people who could not see their hand in front of their face how to run a machine 
that had knives and blades and everything else on it, and they made those brooms. And they take that broom handle. I went, my granddaddy took me down here one time. We rode the bus from Eight Mile, Highway 45 and Shelton Beach Road, rode it downtown, and, and I watched him put that broom handle up there, and that machine grabs it, and somebody else puts that straw material up there, and there's a little wire in the machine, and that, that machine goes, and then the blades cut them straws off, and I mean, all these blind people doing all this stuff, not a one of them got hurt. Not a one of them. Uh, anyway, my granddaddy uh, took those brooms later on where he could get to see a little bit. He took those brooms. He'd go down on the bus. He'd get a dozen of them, put them on his shoulder, get back on the bus, go up Dolphin Street, get off the bus, knock on every house on the front door, go up the door. He had regular customers. He'd go up there and sell brooms for the Mobile Association for the Blind. He got a cut as a salesman took the rest of it down, that's how they supported their operation. Now, my granddaddy was something else. One time when I was a boy, my granddaddy was tempted by somebody to do something, quote unquote, under the table. <clears throat> my granddaddy would not do it. The person said, come on, Morgan, nobody will ever, ever know granddaddy said Morgan Merchant would know and I got to sleep with that fellow every night so he didn't do it I've always respected my granddad for that he didn't sell his self-respect for a plate of porridge self-respect is one of the great great defenses we have against the temptation and testing of Satan who are you Whose are you? You and I are children of Almighty God. We've been adopted. That's a whole study in itself, that one word, adoption. There's a new movie out, Adoption. I sent it to you, did I not? I sent it to your husband, he sent it to you? Yeah. That'd make a good, make a good family night movie. Man, if you ever understand the word adoption in the New Testament Greek, I ain't got time tonight to chase that rabbit, but we, we are adopted children of Almighty God, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Joint heirs with Jesus. That's who we are. That should give us some self-respect. Not pride, not arrogance, but self-respect. And so when Satan comes knocking on your door, remember whose you are and who you are and use that self-respect as a defense. Number two, tradition. Man, I'll tell you, I love this one. Tradition, very few things, very few defenses against temptation testing are as strong as tradition. In the news recently was a story about the Navy SEALs. Anybody see that news? One head, a couple of heads. Well, I'm not going to tell you the whole story. You need to watch the news. <laughs> the Navy SEALs have a, a great tradition. Do you know, y'all look at me like cares of new gate. Y'all know who the Navy SEALs are, don't you? Maybe I should use the Blue Angels. Y'all know, everybody knows who the Blue Angels are, right? Maybe I should use that tradition. And so if you take a tradition like that, and I've given some more in here, um, <clears throat> the SEC football, <laughs> Alabama, Auburn football, if you're on the Alabama Auburn football team, if you're in that family, you've got a tradition. And tradition is strong. You don't want to do anything to bring dishonor to that organization. How would you like to be one of the very few Navy SEALs, one of the very few Blue Angel pilots with all that fame and glory and and all that handed to you there, and you've worked and yearned, you got it, and now you're going to go out and do something stupid, and the whole world will see your face in the newspapers and on the TV about some stupid temptation you fell to? You don't want to do that. You've got a tradition to look out for. You don't want to bring dishonor to the Blue Angels or the Navy SEALs or the Alabama football program or the Auburn football program. Remember that country music song? I'm proud to be an American. I don't want to do anything to bring dishonor to my country. I am a patriot. 
So tradition is strong. It's a great defense to get anything. <clears throat> and then I put in this personal thing, and I've told you all this story. I'm going to tell you one more time. When I was a boy, every time I left the house, my daddy would say, Boy, <clears throat> don't you forget who you are. <laughs> Y'all remember I told you the story. I got real angry when I got about 13, thought I knew everything. My daddy knew nothing. <clears throat> I got really angry when he said that to me, and I was all ready for him, and I exploded. Daddy, I know who I am. I'm Henry Digger, Spotswood Creel. Gave my address, my phone number, blah, blah, blah. My daddy said, No, boy, no, boy. You ain't got a clue what I'm talking about. You don't forget that you are a Creel. And you're not just any Creel. You are Jimmy Creel, boy. Don't you do or say anything when you leave this house that would bring disrespect and dishonor and shame to the Creel name or the Creel household. Now take all of that I've just said about the Blue Angels and the Navy Seals and the football programs and the Creel family. Take all of that and now substitute it for the kingdom of God. You don't want to do anything as an adopted son of Almighty God, joint heir with Jesus Christ. You don't want to do anything to bring dishonor to his name and to his kingdom. That's a great defense when Satan comes ringing your doorbell if you can remember it. And then number four, or number three, for the sake of those whom we love and those who love us, many, many a person would not have yielded and failed if they'd only stopped to consider the hurt, the pain, the destruction that would result from their yielding to that temptation. And then I tell a story about my dad that night. I had gotten home from the, uh, from Germany. I'd spent 31 months in Germany and United States Army. Uh, I had been gone for that long, and, and so I lost track with the guys I'd gone to school with and graduated with. And when I got back, a bunch of those guys got back together. And they invited me to go out on the town one night to do some partying, and I went with them, and we partied. And I got drunk as a skunk. And I mean, I was, what I put the word in here, because I tried to remember this word, in abbreviate in bre because I can't say the word. Say it for me. In e in inebriated. I never could say that word good. What it means is I was smashed. I was drunk. <laughs> I was <laughs> three sheets in the wind. That's what you want to call it. <clears throat> and I came home about three o'clock in the morning, and I'll never ever ever forget. That's burned into my brain, my memory. There stood my dad. No lights on in the house. It was a full moon, so there was some light in the living room in that old frame house where we lived. And there stood my dad. And the tears were just flowing down his face. And what he said to me was, Why, son? Why? That's all he said. And he turned around and walked out. And I realized how I hurt him and crushed him. Because my daddy, he may have had a lot of faults, but he tried to teach me the Word of God and the love of God. And he tried to teach me to be a Christian. And I had disappointed him so bad. Why, son? Why? Can't answer that, daddy, except I was weak. Number four, the presence of Christ. I said this week <clears throat> to y'all, I figure that y you might tire when I pray <laughs> because I say the basically the same prayer every time I pray, or at least I start off the prayer the same way. I always ask you, especially Sunday mornings after Linda plays that beautiful music and I do the call to worship scripture and prayer, I ask for God's presence to be felt and known tangibly. And I always capitalize the word presence when I use it to indicate my respect because it is Almighty God who's present. It's Jesus who died for us who's present. It's Jesus who promised to be with us, even if two of us come together. And I always pray for his presence to be known tangibly, I'm challenging you to sense his presence, open your heart and your spirit to his presence, because when 
when you know his presence is there, his presence gives you understanding of the hymns that we sing, understanding of the spirit that's present in the church, the spirit of love, fellowship. It gives you understanding of the scriptures we're reading, and it should give you peace and joy and comfort. And so I want you to know his presence. Now, when I first started to learn how to pray, I always asked God to be with us, you know, and, and to meet me. Um, but then I finally learned that I didn't have to ask him to be with us because he already is. And so I've learned to ask for us to recognize his presence because he's here. Remember that song, Linda? He is here. Hallelujah. He is here. Amen. <laughs> you played that before. Yeah. I love that song. Okay. All right. We're chasing rabbits. <clears throat> I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we Christians are really good about quoting that verse a lot of times. And, <clears throat> and we're really good about, in church, in Sunday school, knowing those verses. But when we go to work and get out in, in the traffic and in the real world, as some people say, it's very easy to forget that he's sitting right there in the vehicle with us. And he's going in the building with us. And so we go sometimes to places we shouldn't go. And we do things that we know we shouldn't do. And we often say things that we know good and well we shouldn't say. And we forget He's right there. He's right there. But if we could just remember and recognize his presence, practice his presence. There was a Catholic monk who wrote a little short book, Practicing the Presence of God. Great little book. That's what we need to do, practice his presence. Because if we know his presence is with us, we have a great defense against the onslaught of Satan the adversary, and the devil, the slanderer. I told y'all also one time when I was first saved and going to Bethany Baptist Church, and we put on a, a, a play, uh, and I wrote a, a script for a little play, and it was nothing. I thought it was original. I'd never seen or heard it before. Lo and behold, then I found out that... <laughs> Eight million people have written the same thing, you know. Uh, but that's fine. That's good. If yeah, that's how God works, gets all of us to nobody. But created a courtroom scene up in heaven, you know. And here comes each one of our church members. We, we prayed them up there. And, and here is Satan standing over here. He is the accuser. He's the slanderer. <clears throat> the Jewish people believe that in heaven, there is actually, God has actually assigned an angel the task to when, when, when a person goes to heaven, that angel's job is to stand before God and say, this is what he done, <laughs> and to call and to name all of our sins. The Jewish people believe that. That's part of their belief system. Uh, <clears throat> uh, matter of fact, y'all remember one of the first sermons I preached to y'all was the book of Job. And you remember how Job starts off, you know? Uh, God was holding a meeting up in heaven, and all the sons of God came, and Satan Came also, remember? And so the adversary comes. And, and so that's the Jewish belief. So in the plays, the script that I did, so I had the members of, of Bethany Baptist Church, the well-known deacons and leaders of that church would come and into the play, you know, come up on stage, and here's Satan, the accuser, and said, God, let me tell you what he did last Thursday morning at 1022 a.m., <laughs> And he would call out some thing. And we were trying to imitate what it might like be in heaven. And as soon as he brought the charge, the accusation, then the defense attorney over here, who is always Jesus, John tells us in his first epistle that Jesus is our advocate. He's, he's our advocate, right? And so every time Satan makes the accusation, Jesus stands up and says, Objection, Your Honor. I paid for that sin on the cross of Calvary. And he sits down, and God picks up his big hammer and says, Objection sustained. 
and Satan goes, rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> and then he names another one, and it's the same. We just repeat it over and over again, trying to bring the point home that we have been forgiven. Christ paid for those sins on the cross of Calvary, and we should know that and realize that and appreciate that and hang on to that and use that as a defense when Satan comes calling to us. All right, that's all I'm going to do with it tonight. So I hope that every time um, you are out and about, I hope these thoughts will stay with you, and I hope that very often you will quote the Lord's Prayer or read through it, and when you come to that line, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, that some of these thoughts will come back home to help you in that day. Why don't we say the prayer as our benediction tonight? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Thank you all.